Oh, who is that guy she just described? Gaila kes la hamas lo kulatle. Nu guam oedi gai thalaka quick wasutinu kachwatmis. Muskamag zaudinuch. Gaila kes la la kwangen esquimalt. Lo kulatle la kyrtamas witla megans nan makolas kwatnala. Nas ola gala ik no kai duda ko witla megans kwatnala. Nas ola gala slok we masans lo kulatle with a gogaposla. So I'm going to call on Damien Gillis to translate that for me. <laughs> uh, my traditional name is Zowadi, uh, elected chief counselor for the Kwekwasutinu Kwekwatmis. And if that sounds like a long name, it's because the government in its wisdom back in the day decided to take the Kwekwatmis people and move them to be with the Kwekwasutinu people. And we're part of a collective recognized within our culture known as the Muskimag Zaudenu people. I've recognized the territory we're on. I've mentioned that it's good to see you all here. It's good to see us all Golgopotla. That's where we lock arms for strength so we can be so we can be strong in what we do and the reason why we're here. But before going any further, I'd like to share with you a prayer song that, that I've learned. And I, I, I really do enjoy the meaning of the words because it talks about reaching to the Creator or God or, or your, your Supreme Being and seeking help and guidance so that we can see a better future for our children. And I believe that that is why First Nation leaders do what we do, why each and every one of you do what you do to help support, look after Mother Earth, to look after the lands which were set aside for the Treaty 8 First Nations that Canada uh, has conveniently forgotten that they have a commitment to. So uh, I'll share with you, it's a short song, um, and note, please just stay seated, it'd be great. I'm gonna turn this into a rattle. Right. <laughs> Wallasun magitla, ikigigmai, kwakwalalak yachnu, atlu. Wallasun magitla, ikigayo. Lums do pula gin gin and woo. I eat your Lums do pula gin gin Thank you. And uh, I learned that back in the 1900s. <laughs> and uh, this is when I asked the technical people if you could pull up my PowerPoint. Of course, now they're scurrying around thinking I gave them one, but I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> You started this. <laughs> I was trying to think, how can I get up to the bar that was that high with such laughter? <laughs> you, know, the, uh, you know, without the laughter, I don't know where our First Nations people would be. You know, we'd be dead and long gone now if we didn't learn to laugh. And laugh at the pain, and laugh at the suffering, and laugh at the insanity of the world that has sprung up around us and all the wonderful things that Canada has done that's good for Indians. We know what's best for you. You know, and they make mistakes time and time again. Generations go by and they still make mistakes and they still think they know what to do for us. Never wanting to honestly understand that we know how to look after ourselves. We know how to look after the environment. That's why it was as pristine and as abundant when everybody showed up to come visit us. And of course, we're like, right on, more friends, let's eat. And then 
Canada unfolded around us. And now, when I think of Canada, I think of the hard truths that the society is having to come to terms with today. And those hard truths are the very fact that the founders of this country took a very, very racist attitude towards First Nations people, period. And I know what this does is it sets a table for some discussions that are going to be incredibly uncomfortable for the Canadian society. But it must happen. It's about justice. It's about equality. And it's about fairness. When I was fortunate enough to spend time with my uncle Michael Dick, who taught me how to sing, and he was quite a character, he was a nurse for 34 years, fluent in the West world, fluent in our language and culture, and he always told me his name was Michael Miles Patrick Michelle Van Dick III. <laughs> and I just, still today, I don't know if that was really his name. <laughs> But with Uncle Mike, he told me, he said he was born on the banks of the Kingham River in a canoe with an eagle flying over top. <laughs> and when I spoke at his, you know, at the celebration of his life, I looked around the room and I said, you know what? I don't think anybody could be any more Indian than that, I said, you know. <laughs> but what he taught me about our stories of origin, you know, as, as the Muskimak Dao people, we have these stories that place us in this universe, that place us in this cosmos. And they're ours. And they talk about mountains, Nigye. The Liluagila people is the raven sat on top of the mountain and the people came from there. Kawadilakla. And this is an interesting one because it was these mythical wolves, four of them. And the oldest one, Kawadilakla, and had a, a younger brother named Kulili and a sister named Hayathilagas. And I always forget the last one, and you'll understand why. So the youngest one played a game with the oldest brother, and the younger one was the winner. And he had great fun teasing his older brother that he won. And of course, he carried it too far, like any younger sibling would do. And so the oldest one tore him apart, used his magical powers, and he turned him to eagle down, and he blew him to the winds. And wherever Eagle Down would land around the world, people would spring up and speak a different language. And I find that really fascinating because not only does it give a sense of place for this one Namima or clan of our Zawadeno people, but it helps us conceptualize there's lots of other people in the world. And when Uncle Mike told me the stories of the Kwikwasutinuk and the Hukwatmi's people, and the bottom line in his teaching to me was, none of them are more important than the other. They all just are. And I really take that to heart. Because we're, in our language, we are one people. We all have the same love for our children and our mothers and fathers and grandfathers and uncles. And if you're fortunate enough to be Indian, you've got about a thousand cousins. <laughs> right? Makes dating kind of complicated, eh, Caleb? <laughs> but to know that we are one people as part of this human race on this planet. But when we reflect back on Canada, Sir John A. Macdonald, 1867 or 1876. Sorry, I never graduated from high school. <laughs> Gave it a good try, though. But John A. Macdonald, in all his wisdom at the beginning of Canada, decided that Indian residential schools were the best thing for Indians. Let's destroy the child within the family. Let's absorb Indians into the body politic of Canada. What a racist thing to do. Targeting a race of people by breaking up the families, by targeting the children, outlawing our culture, punishment for our language, this is Canada's foundation, and it's a difficult one. And now that we've had the government stand up and acknowledge it and apologize, and then the Truth and Reconciliation Commission did it work to be able to conceptualize for everybody the atrocities. And if you're First Nation, you're a residential school survivor. My mom told me all about her experience, and I remember being raised, got spanked, and so on. But that was just what my mom knew. 
And so I think it's important for Canadians to understand that impact is still living today with the struggles that we have as people. Uh, usually when I'm in a church, I'm saying things like, my name is Bob and I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> right? Usually in the, in the church basement drinking coffee. Right? But... Uh, <laughs> 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 Damien doesn't even want to make eye contact now. <laughs> But to come to terms with the things, the pains that we have worked to cover up, because the pains are atrocious, and they're hard-hitting, and they destroy families. And so now that we have Canada coming to a point where, they want to, where they've apologized for what they've done, and now we're wondering, well, that's great. How are we going to continue the process of reconciliation with First, First Nations people? For those of us who are gifted enough to be in a 12-step program like myself, you know that healing is definitely a journey, and so is reconciliation. It is not a destination. And when I think of Canada, there's something that we all must agree on about this country. The Constitution is the foundation of the democracy. That's a fact. The Constitution recognizes existing Aboriginal and treaty rights. So that's the foundation of Canada. And we also must accept the fact that the Supreme Court of Canada gives direction to the government in making law. And the Supreme Court of Canada has stated again and again and again for decades now, giving concepts to the government to embrace about Aboriginal rights, the scope and breadth of them for their machine. And now with the Chilcotin decision, Aboriginal title. And the, the, the reality of consent-based decision-making in the title lands. And I think one of the most important pieces of Chilcotin for me is the fact that the government cannot wiggle away from the territorial nature of our lands. Because that's been solidified in that Supreme Court of Canada ruling. And it can't go anywhere else now. That's the law of the land. And so as we go forward, as First Nations people. It just breaks my heart to see us going to the courts again. Because we're still seeking justice. We're still seeking the proper recognition of our peoples in the lands which we know have been ours since the beginning of time. And now we have a governance that has, by its own definition by the Supreme Court of Canada, is exercising authority based upon presumed crown title presumed crown title. And the goal of reconciliation is nested right within section 35.1 of the Constitution. And that reconciliation is to reconcile the presumed crown title with existing underlying Aboriginal title. And so now, when we consider that, that's the highest court in the land telling every prime minister for quite some time now that this is justice for our people. No more would Canada, and I want to urge all of you to think about this, because Canada was based upon this concept of terra nullius. This might be the only true Latin words that I know. I didn't go to a Catholic church. <laughs> and I wouldn't have gone there even if there was honoraria. <laughs> but so terra nullius, and Canada basing its authority on this concept is about vacant lands. We were, it wasn't vacant. Who do you think helped the visitors make it through the first winters when they didn't know what to do? Or picked up George Vancouver and put him back on his boat up here in the, in the Fraser River? And so on. But it's a way that shows that our people, we respect and love people. And that is the way. What, what do you do when you go to an Indian house? Are you hungry? Sit down, let's eat. And it's always that way. It's welcoming. It's respectful. It's inclusive. And then we have this concept of ourselves that runs headlong into this Western concept of individual wealth. And so the bigger my car is, or my cabin, or my condominium, or my holidays, and yet when you look at First Nations people, I know with the way of our people, the richer you are, the only way you establish your true wealth is by giving it away. 
Now, could you imagine what that looked like to the visitors when they arrived? Look at this guy, he's giving everything away. But that was how we looked after our people. That was how our traditional governance system, founded on our culture, with wealth drawn from the territories which were ours, took care of everybody. And now we're faced with a completely different paradigm now of personal wealth and, and bottom line and, and profit margins and shareholders. And this is where we run into a great problem because now industry has run amok in this country for generations. And if any of you are interested, you like reading, there's a book I read called Prisons of Grass and I encourage everybody to read it. It was written by a half-breed Indian from the prairies and it's a very concise, factual hammer hit about what happened to First Nations people in Canada. It's not a victim-based telling. It's like, this is what happened. And you can understand better about the struggles First Nations have had within Canada since it first began. And as we've progressed through all that we've experienced now. But as a leader of a small community, we have uh, 25 people at home. Uh, we've managed to rebuild the entire community. Uh, this year we're building eight houses. It'll make 20 new homes in six years for a population of 25. And it's been about our, ourselves looking after ourselves. So for every one of those homes, our First Nation gathered up money to provide a $120,000 grant times 20 homes now, so that's 2.4 million. And so we're being responsible. We're looking at how do we make sure we stay here in our lands. And so we move forward with that. But as we come into the reality of today, where we have the federal government, the previous one that dodged the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, to the shame of all Canadians. Because now when you consider that document, we're talking about a set of minimum standards for human rights. Human rights. And you can see how that is really juxtaposed. I use that word just for you, Damien, juxtaposed. <laughs> With the idea of vacant lands, of terra nullius, right? We are human beings. And in the courts for far too long, the first challenge we've had to face with the uh, government lawyers is to prove that we were a people. And this just ended, I'm not even sure if it's ended, but it's, it's very recent. And they still want us to prove that we're people. And I find that to be utterly amazing in 2018, that we're still having to face that. So with the government, of the, the federal government, embracing the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, this is a really positive step for Canada. Remember what I said earlier, well, the apology arrived, now what? Well, embracing the UN Declaration, like I'm still holding the rattle, hold on. But embracing the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People is the now what? This is where we start to see some substantive actions to begin to peel back that onion, to start getting down to what it is that First Nations who need justice served will arrive at. And what that means in my mind and in many of the leaders I've spoken to, it's about recognition of our authority in our traditional lands and nothing short of that. And why do we want that? Why would any of us want to look after the lands which were ours? It's for our children. It's for our grandchildren. And as I've stated to Premier Horgan not too long ago when we were talking about the fish farms, oh, thank you for the shout out about the fish farms. Appreciate that. <laughs> Another good idea by government. There's a word in our language called kihomas, and that's when your canoe drifts away, and that's just what happened to me now. I forgot what I was talking about. <laughs> fish farms. So I see what happens. You mention fish farms, I start twitching. Okay, when we, when we think about the justice in the proper place for Canadian, uh, for First Nations people, we're talking about a fundamental change in how Canada is Canada. A fundamental change in how the province of BC makes decisions 
on the presumed crown title lands that they have developed a mass machine to have authority over. And so this is not small work, this is massive, but it must happen. It has to happen. For Canada to fill the jersey that it shows the world of being a just, fair, open, embracing, you know, it's, it has to happen. And so now that the federal government has come up with the 10 principles to guide this reconciliation and set the table for the UN Declaration to be implemented, I hope each of you go home, if you haven't read it already, and look it up. Read about the Ten Principles, because it talks about First Nations' inherent authority. That word scares the pants off of both federal and provincial governments, inherent. Because when we have, and we do have, inherent authority over our governance and our lands, it means it cannot be changed by statutes of the government. They feel more comfortable when it's Aboriginal rights because that way they can modify them or overrule them because that's their tool. What, I'm th what we all know is our inherent right. And I think of the inherent right as a little boy in Guayastums in our village, watching my granny work on fish and clams and going jigging cod with my Uncle Georgie. And how exciting that was as a seven-year-old putting up a rock cod. It's like the biggest fish in the world for a seven-year-old. And then the fun part about learning how to clean it, because you know what you do, you first you grab it by the eyes. Yeah. But the memories that I have, and I know that my granny's granny taught her. And so when I think about that, my granny was born in the early 1900s. And so her grandmother would have been living in, the, in our territories in the early 1800s. And so just by skipping a few generations, we go back before Canada began. And those resources and those lands were ours. I was thinking about Joe Gosnell from Anishka and how visionary he was back in the day. Do you remember? Lock, stock, and barrel. Well, Chilcotin pretty much proved that. And now Canada's coming to terms with that. But the topic that we've all gathered to talk about Site C, I've been really fortunate to paddle the peace, twice now. And it was one of the most wonderful experiences. Is Dave Suzuki still in? Is he still here? Hey, Dave. I want to apologize to you. How many of you remember that incredible life-saving effort that Dave Suzuki did when that man fell off the canoe? Yeah. Remember that? Remember that? I tweeted the pictures out, Dave. <laughs> I was like, check that out. So I started taking pictures. I was like, we got coverage. So I tweeted out, Dave Suzuki, saving paddler. <laughs> but I got to say, when you landed on the... I know. <laughs> no, that, that's when you were one-arming him out of the water. <laughs> but when I realized he was standing in water this deep, I was like, oh, well. <laughs> Minor details of a heroic story. But I do have a real nice picture of you, Dave, when you were landing, coming in on the canoe by yourself. I was like, whoa, majestic. I was like, look at that. <laughs> Blends right in. <laughs> but for Site C, we have a treaty with the group of First Nations. And that's your treaty. Everyone that's Canadian, put your hands up if you're Canadian. That treaty's with you. And so when the governments decide to ignore it, when the government decides to do things contrary to it or forget inconvenient pieces of it, they're doing that on behalf of you. And this, to me, when I think about treaties across Canada, is one of the greatest initial injustices of this country. That it can, in good faith, make such agreements and then forget about them. And then run roughshod over people's rights and to lay waste to the territory and the food sources. Breaks my heart to think you can't eat the fish in the rivers. That is a shame. I remember the picture you showed me of your son with that big fish. Learned a good valuable lesson that day too from Chief Rollins. I don't take pictures of other people's children. He showed me a picture of his son, it was a beautiful fish. Right? And what we're talking about is a, it's not a menu choice. And that's what I had to get across to Horgan, and it was news to him, which I found rather fascinating. I was like, it's who we are, guy, it's who we are. 
And I've traveled to different places around the world, Norway with Damien, and I always told people, our people are fish eaters and clam diggers, and we're extremely proud of both because it's the foundation of who we are. We have built a very rich and diverse culture, traditions, values, that we want to do nothing more than to pass on to our children and our great-grandchildren and so on. Nothing different than anybody else and anybody else's culture. But for some reason, it's okay in Canada to take issue with us as people. There was a gentleman I saw earlier. He was wearing the Caucasian T-shirt. I don't know if you're still here. There you are. Can you stand up and show everyone that T-shirt? I had a great big smile because I was, I was thinking about this whole thing earlier today and yesterday. Now, there are many different races in, in the world. And you know, with cartoons and caricatures, they're often very unflattering. And the old ones are really unflattering. And yet today, if you picked any race of people and you did a caricature and marketed it to the global economy, there would be great uproar about the inappropriate, racist paradigm that that represents. But I was thinking about the Cleveland Indians t-shirt when I saw that Caucasian. I almost bought that shirt. But it, it's that easy for the society of North America to diminish First Nations people. It's okay to put a racist caricature on a, on a national, on a team, and market it. It's just Indians. But if you picked another race of people, it would be utterly unacceptable. And that's the societal challenge that we have to overcome. Because I think the more we have dialogue like tonight and today, the more we're going to understand one another. And I think when we start to reach a point of deeper understanding of who we are, each and every one of us, and how we relate to each other, and how we see our families and our lands and our resources and so on, the less room there is for fear. And then the greater opportunity to love. And this is what I think of, and I've mentioned this to the six ministers that are working on reconciliation. I said, it's absolutely correct what you're doing about defining how Canada is going to approach reconciliation with First Nations people and the review of past legislation, law, regulations, and policy that don't make sense. It's all what you need to do. We have to bring Canadians with us. When we embark on a political reconciliation path, when we're successful, it's going to represent a very fundamental change in how the government operates, especially in relationship to resource extraction projects. And we must bring Canadians with us to understand why it's going to occur, that there needs to be the societal reconciliation of the heart, of our minds coming together to truly understand each other, and so we can stand together. And I've often said there's no need to fear prosperous First Nations. We're not going anywhere. All right? We're from our lands. We're staying in our lands. We will be in our lands forever. When we get to the point where we have authority in our lands, when projects go forward with our definition of sustainability that makes sense to people, <laughs> not a spreadsheet, and then when we have the wealth from our territories as we've always had before, we'll look after our people as we always have in the places that we're from. And that money is going to stay in the local economies, whether it's up in Treaty 8 or Northern Vancouver Island or where have you. And we are always a very generous, giving, loving, caring people. I want to tell a joke now. <laughs> Damien, do you know why the frog took the why the frog took the bus? His car got towed. <laughs> Sorry, bro. I knew you wouldn't get it. <laughs> About the laughter, right? What would we do without it? You know, people always say you have to have the ability to laugh at yourself. 
<laughs> I got a lot of material. <laughs> but the messages that we bring out to Canadians, we cannot rely solely upon mainstream media. You cannot, it is impossible to explain a complex set of information about AAA bond rating and indemnity and all that stuff. You can't do that in 15 seconds that the appetite of modern media has. Right? We have to figure out the way to do that ourselves. And I always try to tell people there's more than Facebook on the internet, but no one believes me. These are how we're going to get the message out. But we need to make sure that we... I mean, I could record a video right now, a 30-second bite on one topic on Site C and get it out, and everybody could retweet it. And that's how we start to break down the barriers and the limitations of modern media. But it takes that effort and the braveness to do it. And we have to find ways to support the media that have the heart in the right place, that represent as the common sense Canadian. You know, I like to tease my bro Damien, but I admire his work. I admire his thoroughness. And don't ever argue with him. It's not a good idea. Or you better know your facts if you're going to debate anything with him. But the thing is, that's what I see as the key to getting the proper, fulsome message out to Canadians so they can understand the, whatever topic it may be. You know, for us, it's fish farms. On January 30th, our collective of First Nations in the North Island have a meeting with four ministers about tenure renewal. And we're demanding that we have government to government, UN Declaration on Rights of Indigenous People, free prior and informed consent process, nothing less. When we, <clears throat> as the Muskimog Tsaurenok people and the Numgis Nation and the Mama Lilikla are standing together, we've eradicated some of the biggest hurdles the government likes to use. We have addressed our overlap of our territories. We are united in who we are. And there's no way. There is no opportunity for government to find a way to use overlap to infiltrate one of us and exploit the rest. And so now, and the reason I share that with you as I'm finishing my remarks is because we are all disappointed in Horgan's government to date in terms of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. We demand more. We demand honor and integrity. That's what we demand. We demonstrated honor by voting for him, and we demand it back. And that's not unrealistic. That's fair. That's just. And so as we go forward, and I've mentioned this to all our collective leadership on the fish farm issue, I said we must realize that all First Nations and Canadians and British Columbians are going to be watching this, and we're going to work very hard to make sure you know what's happening. Because the moment they step offside from the UN Declaration and free prior and informed consent, everyone's going to know. And I want everyone to be watching because what we're going to be witnessing now is whether this government has the real metal to stand up and lead with the words and commitments it gave to every one of us. And so this is what's coming down the pipe for them, and it's not going to be a very comfortable discussion for them, but that's just tough. You know? But in closing, I, I, I want to acknowledge the leadership of Treaty 8 and the people you represent. Oh, the Gelafilkermassens, truly strong. And you're standing up for what is right and what is just. And for every one of us that is here, we believe in this fight. But it's going to take more than our belief, it's going to take more than our tweets, it's going to take more than sharing things on Facebook. It's going to take money. So, and this is a reality. And so we have to 
look into our social circles, our circles of influence where we work, our social network, and say, hey, let's all throw in 10 bucks. And then we have the conversation again in another month, say, let's throw in 20. All right? We can make coffee at home. We don't have to go to Tim Hortons or Starbucks every day. But we can support the nations that are on the front line of looking after the Peace River, one of the most beautiful places on this planet, and we must stand united with them. Gaelic Hamas <laughs>